Chapter Fifteen of Pellucidar. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Ralph Snelson. Pellucidar by Edgar Rice Burroughs. Chapter Fifteen, Conquest and Peace. The fleet sailed directly for Hooge's Island coming to anchor at its northeastern extremity before the flat-topped hill that had been Hooge's stronghold. I sent one of the prisoners ashore to demand an immediate surrender, but as he told me afterward they wouldn't believe all that he told them, so they congregated on the cliff-top and shot futile arrows at us. In reply I had five of the flukas cannonade them. When they scampered away at the sound of the terrific explosions, and at sight of the smoke and the iron balls, I landed a couple of hundred red warriors and led them to the opposite end of the hill into the tunnel that ran to its summit. Here we met a little resistance, but a volley from the muzzle-loaders turned back those who disputed our right of way, and presently we gained the mesa. Here again we met resistance, but at last the remnant of Hooge's horde surrendered. Juog was with me, and I lost no time in returning to him and his tribe the hilltop that had been their ancestral home for ages until they were robbed of it by Hooja. I created a kingdom of the island, making Juog king there. Before we sailed I went to Gurgurgur, chief of the beast men, taking Juog with me. There the three of us arranged a code of laws that would permit the brute folk and the human beings of the island to live in peace and harmony. Gurgurgur sent his son with me back to Sari, capital of my empire, that he might learn the ways of the human beings. I have hopes of turning this race into the greatest agriculturists of Pellucidar. When I returned to the fleet I found that one of the islanders of Juog's tribe, who had been absent when we arrived, had just returned from the mainland with the news that a great army was encamped in the land of awful shadow, and that they were threatening Thuria. I lost no time in weighing anchors and setting out for the continent, which we reached after a short and easy voyage. From the deck of the Amos I scanned the shore through the glasses that Perry had brought with him. When we were close enough for the glasses to be of value, I saw that there was indeed a vast concourse of warriors entirely encircling the walled village of Gork, chief of the Thurians. As we approached, smaller objects became distinguishable. It was then that I discovered numerous flags and pennants floating above the army of the besiegers. I called Perry and passed the glasses to him. "'Gok of Sari,' I said. Perry looked through the lenses for a moment, and then turned to me with a smile. "'The red, white, and blue of the Empire,' he said. "'It is indeed your Majesty's army.' It soon became apparent that we had been sighted by those on shore, for a great multitude of warriors had congregated along the beach watching us. We came to anchor as close in as we dared, which with our light feluccas was within easy speaking distance of the shore. Gok was there, and his eyes were mighty wide, too, for as he told us later, though he knew this must be Perry's fleet, it was so wonderful to him that he could not believe the testimony of his own eyes even while he was watching it approach. To give the proper effect to our meeting, I commanded that each felucca fire twenty-one guns as a salute to His Majesty Gok, King of Sari. Some of the gunners, in the exuberance of their enthusiasm, fired solid shot, but fortunately they had sufficient good judgment to train their pieces on the open sea, so no harm was done. After this we landed, an arduous task, since each felucca carried but a single light dugout. I learned from Gok that the Thurian chieftain Gork had been inclined to haughtiness, and had told Gok, the hairy one, but he knew nothing of me and cared less. But I imagine that the sight of the fleet and the sound of the guns brought him to his senses, for it was not long before he sent a deputation to me, inviting me to visit him in his village. Here he apologized for the treatment he had accorded me, very gladly swore allegiance to the empire, and received in return the title of king. 
We remained in Thuria only long enough to arrange the treaty with Gork, among the other details of which was his promise to furnish the imperial army with a thousand lidi, or Thurian beasts of burden, and drivers for them. These were to accompany Gok's army back to Sari by land, while the fleet sailed to the mouth of the great river from which Diane, Juag, and I had been blown. The voyage was uneventful. We found the river easily, and sailed up it for many miles through as rich and wonderful a plain as I have ever seen. At the head of navigation we disembarked, leaving a sufficient guard for the Feluccas, and marched the remaining distance to Sari. Gok's army, which was composed of warriors of all the original tribes of the Federation, showing how successful had been his efforts to rehabilitate the empire, marched into Sari some time after we arrived. With them were the thousand Lidi from Thuria. At a council of the kings it was decided that we should at once commence the great war against the Mahars, for these haughty reptiles presented the greatest obstacle to human progress within Pellucidar. I laid out a plan of campaign which met with the enthusiastic endorsement of the kings. Pursuant to it, I at once dispatched fifty Lidi to the fleet, with orders to fetch fifty cannon to Sari. I also ordered the fleet to proceed at once to Anorak, where they were to take aboard all the rifles and ammunition that had been completed since their departure, and with a full complement of men to sail along the coast in an attempt to find a passage to the inland sea near which lay the Mahar's buried city of Futra. Jaw was sure that a large and navigable river connected the Sea of Futra with the Lural As, and barring accident the fleet would be before Futra as soon as the land forces were. At last the great army started upon its march. There were warriors from every one of the federated kingdoms. All were armed either with bow and arrows or muzzle-loaders, for nearly the entire Mesop contingent had been enlisted for this march only sufficient having been left aboard the feluccas to man them properly. I divided the forces into divisions, regiments, battalions, companies, and even to platoons and sections, appointing the full complement of officers and non-commissioned officers. On the long march I schooled them in their duties, and as fast as one learned I sent him among the others as a teacher. Each regiment was made up of about a thousand bowmen, and to each was temporarily attached a company of Mesop musketeers and a battery of artillery, the latter our naval guns, mounted upon the broad backs of the mighty Lidi. There was also one full regiment of Mesop musketeers and a regiment of primitive spearmen. The rest of the Lidi that we brought with us were used for baggage animals and to transport our women and children for we had brought them with us, as it was our intention to march from one Mahar city to another until we had subdued every Mahar nation that menaced the safety of any kingdom of the empire. Before we reached the plain of Futra, we were discovered by a company of Sagos, who at first stood to give battle, but upon seeing the vast numbers of our army, they turned and fled toward Futra. The result of this was that when we came in sight of the hundred towers which marked the entrances to the buried city, we found a great army of Sagoths and Mahars lined up to give us battle. At a thousand yards we halted, and placing our artillery upon a slight eminence at either flank, we commenced to drop solid shot among them. Ja, who was chief artillery officer, was in command of this branch of the service, and he did some excellent work for his Mesop gunners had become rather proficient by this time. The Sagos couldn't stand much of this sort of warfare, so they charged us yelling like fiends. We let them come quite close, and then the musketeers who formed the first line opened up on them. The slaughter was something frightful, but still the remnants of them kept on coming until it was a matter of hand-to-hand -hand fighting. Here our spearmen were of value, as were also the crude iron swords with which most of the imperial warriors were armed. We lost heavily in the encounter after the Sagoths reached us, but they were absolutely exterminated. Not one remained even as a prisoner. 
the mahars seeing how the battle was going had hastened to the safety of their buried city when we had overcome their gorilla men we followed after them but here we were doomed to defeat at least temporarily for no sooner had the first of our troops descended into the subterranean avenues than many of them came stumbling and fighting their way back to the surface half choked by the fumes of some deadly gas that the reptiles had liberated upon them we lost a number of men here then i sent for perry who had remained discreetly in the rear and had him construct a little affair that i had had in my mind against the possibility of our meeting with a check at the entrances to the underground city under my direction he stuffed one of his cannon full of powder small bullets and pieces of stone almost to the muzzle then he plugged the muzzle tight with a cone-shaped block of wood hammered and jammed it in as tight as it could be next he inserted a long fuse a dozen men rolled the cannon to the top of the stairs leading down into the city first removing it from its carriage one of them then lit the fuse and the whole thing was given a shove down the stairway while the detachment turned and scampered to a safe distance for what seemed a very long time nothing happened we had commenced to think that the fuse had been put out while the piece was rolling down the stairway or that the mahars had guessed its purpose and extinguished it themselves when the ground about the entrance rose suddenly into the air to be followed by a terrific explosion and a burst of smoke and flame that shot high in company with dirt stone and fragments of cannon perry had been working on two more of these giant bombs as soon as the first was completed presently we launched these into two of the other entrances they were all that were required for almost immediately after the third explosion a stream of mahar broke from the exits furthest from us rose upon their wings and soared northward a hundred men on leedy were dispatched in pursuit each leedy carrying two riflemen in addition to its driver guessing that the inland sea which lay not far north of futra was their destination i took a couple of regiments and followed a low ridge intervenes between the futra plain where the city lies and the inland sea where the mahars were wont to disport themselves in the cool waters not until we had topped this ridge did we get a view of the sea then we beheld a scene that i shall never forget so long as i may live along the beach were lined up the troop of Lidi, while a hundred yards from shore the surface of the water was black with the long snouts and cold reptilian eyes of the mahars our savage mizop riflemen and the shorter squatter white-skinned thurian drivers shading their eyes with their hands were gazing seaward beyond the mahars whose eyes were fastened upon the same spot my heart leaped when I discovered that which was chaining the attention of them all. Twenty graceful felucas were moving smoothly across the waters of the sea toward the reptilian horde. The sight must have filled the Mahars with awe and consternation, for never had they seen the like of these craft before. For a time they seemed unable to do aught but gaze at the approaching fleet, but when the Mesops opened on them with their muskets, the reptiles swam rapidly in the direction of the feluccas, evidently thinking that these would prove the easier to overcome. The commander of the fleet permitted them to approach within a hundred yards. Then he opened on them with all the cannon that could be brought to bear, as well as with the small arms of the sailors. A great many of the reptiles were killed at the first volley. They wavered for a moment, then dived nor did we see them again for a long time but finally they rose far out beyond the fleet and when the feluccas came about and pursued them they left the water and flew away toward the north following the fall of futra i visited anorak where i found the people busy in the shipyards and the factories that perry had established i discovered something too that he had not told me of something that seemed infinitely more promising than the powder factory or the arsenal it was a young man poring over one of the books i had brought back from the outer world he was sitting in the log cabin that perry had had built to serve as his sleeping quarters and office so absorbed was he that he did not notice our entrance 
Perry saw the look of astonishment in my eyes and smiled. I started teaching him the alphabet when we first reached the prospector, and were taking out its contents, he explained. He was much mystified by the books and anxious to know of what use they were. When I explained, he asked me to teach him to read, and so I worked with him whenever I could. He is very intelligent and learns quickly. Before I left, he had made great progress, and as soon as he is qualified, he is going to teach others to read. It was mighty hard work getting started, though, for everything had to be translated into Pellucidarium. It will take a long time to solve this problem, but I think that by teaching a number of them to read and write English, we shall then be able more quickly to give them a written language of their own. And this was the nucleus about which we were to build our great system of schools and colleges, this almost naked red warrior sitting in Perry's little cabin upon the island of Anorak, picking out words letter by letter from a work on intensive farming. Now we have, but I'll get to all that before I finish. While we were at Anorak, I accompanied Jaw in an expedition to South Island, the southernmost of the three largest which form the Anorak group. Perry had given it its name, where we made peace with the tribe there that had for long been hostile toward Jaw. They were now glad enough to make friends with him and come into the Federation. From there we sailed with sixty-five feluccas for distant Luana, the main island of the group where dwell the hereditary enemies of Anorak. Twenty-five of the feluccas were of a new and larger type than those with which Ja and Perry had sailed on the occasion when they chanced to find and rescue Diane and me. They were longer, carried much larger sails, and were considerably swifter. Each carried four guns instead of two and these were so arranged that one or more of them could be brought into action no matter where the enemy lay. The Luana group lies just beyond the range of vision from the mainland. The largest island of it alone is visible from Anorak, but when we neared it we found that it comprised many beautiful islands, and that they were thickly populated. The Luanians had not, of course, been ignorant of all that had been going on in the domains of their nearest and dearest enemies. They knew of our feluccas and our guns, for several of their riding parties had had a taste of both. But their principal chief, an old man, had never seen either. So when he sighted us, he put out to overwhelm us, bringing with him a fleet of about a hundred large war canoes, loaded to capacity with javelin-armed warriors. It was pitiful, and I told Ja as much. It seemed a shame to massacre these poor fellows if there was any way out of it. To my surprise, Ja felt much as I did. He said he had always hated to war with other Mesops when there were so many alien races to fight against. I suggested that we hail the chief and request a parley. But when Ja did so, the old fool thought that we were afraid and with loud cries of exultation urged his warriors upon us. So we opened up on them, but at my suggestion centered our fire upon the chief's canoe. The result was that in about thirty seconds there was nothing left of that war dugout but a handful of splinters, while its crew, those who were not killed, were struggling in the water, battling with the myriad terrible creatures that had risen to devour them. We saved some of them, but the majority died just as had Huja and the crew of his canoe that time our second shot capsized them. Again we called to the remaining warriors to enter into a parley with us, but the chief's son was there, and he would not, now that he had seen his father killed. He was all for revenge, so we had to open up on the brave fellows with all our guns, but it didn't last long at that for there chanced to be wiser heads among the Luanians than their chief or his son had possessed. Presently an old warrior, who commanded one of the dugouts, surrendered. After that they came in one by one, until all had laid their weapons upon our decks. Then we called together upon the flagship all our captains, to give the affair greater weight and dignity, and all the principal men of Luana, we had conquered them, and they expected either death or slavery, but they deserved neither, and I told them so. It is always my habit here in Pellucidar 
to impress upon these savage people that mercy is as noble a quality as physical bravery, and that next to the men who fight shoulder to shoulder with one, we should honor the brave men who fight against us, and if we are victorious, award them both the mercy and honor that are their due. By adhering to this policy, I have won to the Federation many great and noble peoples, who under the ancient traditions of the inner world would have been massacred or enslaved after we had conquered them. And thus I won the Luanians. I gave them their freedom, and returned their weapons to them after they had sworn loyal to me and friendship and peace with Jah. And I made the old fellow who had had the good sense to surrender king of Luana, for both the old chief and his only son had died in the battle. When I sailed away from Luana, she was included among the kingdoms of the empire, whose boundaries were thus pushed eastward several hundred miles. We now returned to Anorak, and thence to the mainland, where I again took up the campaign against the Mahars, marching from one great buried city to another, until we had passed far north of Amos into a country where I had never been. At each city we were victorious, killing or capturing the Sagoths and driving the Mahars further away. I noticed that they always fled toward the north. The Sagoth prisoners we usually found quite ready to transfer their allegiance to us, for they are little more than brutes, and when they found that we could fill their stomachs and give them plenty of fighting, they were nothing loath to march with us against the next Mahar city and battle with men of their own race. Thus we proceeded, swinging in a great half-circle north and west and south again, until we had come back to the edge of the Lidi plains north of Thuria. Here we overcame the Mahar city that had ravaged the land of awful shadow for so many ages. When we marched on to Thuria, Gork and his people went mad with joy at the tidings we brought them. During this long march of conquest we had passed through seven countries, peopled by primitive human tribes who had not yet heard of the Federation, and succeeded in joining them all to the Empire. It was noticeable that each of these peoples had a Mahar city situated nearby, which had drawn upon them for slaves and human food for so many ages that not even in legend had the population any folk tale which did not in some degree reflect an inherent terror of the reptilians. In each of these countries I left an officer and warriors to train them in military discipline and prepare them to receive the arms that I intended furnishing them as rapidly as Perry's arsenal could turn them out for we felt that it would be a long, long time before we should see the last of the Mahars, that they had flown north but temporarily until we should be gone with our great army and terrifying guns, I was positive, and equally sure was I that they would presently return. The task of ridding Pellucidar of these hideous creatures is one which in all probability will never be entirely completed for their great cities must abound by the hundreds and thousands of the far distant lands that no subject of the empire has ever laid eyes upon. But within the present boundaries of my domain there are now none left that I know of, for I am sure we should have heard indirectly of any great Mahar city that had escaped us, although of course the imperial army has by no means covered the vast area which I now rule. After leaving Thuria, we returned to Sari, where the seat of government is located. Here, upon a vast fertile plateau, overlooking the great gulf that runs into the continent from the Laurel Az, we are building the great city of Sari. Here we are erecting mills and factories. Here we are teaching men and women the rudiments of agriculture. Here Perry has built the first printing press, and a dozen young Saurians are teaching their fellows to read and write the language of Pellucidar. We have just laws, and only a few of them. Our people are happy because they are always working at something which they enjoy. There is no money, nor is any money value placed upon any commodity. Perry and I were as one in resolving that the root of all evil should not be introduced into Pellucidar while we lived. A man may exchange that which he produces for something which he desires that another has produced, but he cannot dispose of the thing he thus acquires. 
In other words, a commodity ceases to have pecuniary value the instant that it passes out of the hands of its producer. All excess reverts to government, and as this represents the production of the people as a government, government may dispose of it to other peoples in exchange for that which they produce. Thus we are establishing a trade between kingdoms, the profits from which go to the betterment of the people, to building factories for the manufacture of agricultural implements, and machinery for the various trades we are gradually teaching the people. Already Anorak and Luana are vying with one another in the excellence of the ships they build. Each has several large shipyards. Anorak makes gunpowder and mines iron ore and by means of their ships they carry on a very lucrative trade with Thuria, Sari, and Amos. The Thurians breed Lidi, which, having the strength and intelligence of an elephant, make excellent draft animals. Around Sari and Amos the men are domesticating the great striped antelope, the meat of which is most delicious. I am sure that it will not be long before they will have them broken to harness and saddle. The horses of Pellucidar are far too diminutive for such uses, some species of them being little larger than fox terriers. Diane and I live in a great palace overlooking the gulf. There is no glass in our windows, for we have no windows, the walls rising but a few feet above the floor line, the rest of the space being open to the ceilings. But we have a roof to shade us from the perpetual noonday sun, Perry and I decided to set a style in architecture that would not curse future generations with the white plague, so we have plenty of ventilation. Those of the people who prefer still inhabit their caves, but many are building houses similar to ours. At Greenwich we have located a town and an observatory, though there is nothing to observe but the stationary sun directly overhead. Upon the edge of the land of awful shadow is another observatory from which the time is flashed by wireless to every corner of the empire twenty-four times a day. In addition to the wireless, we have a small telephone system in Sari. Everything is yet in the early stages of development, but with the science of the outer world twentieth century to draw upon, we are making rapid progress and with all the faults and errors of the outer world to guide us clear of dangers, I think that it will not be long before Pellucidar will become as nearly a utopia as one may expect to find this side of heaven. Perry is away just now, laying out a railway line from Sari to Amos. There are immense anthracite coal fields at the head of the gulf not far from Sari, and the railway will tap these, some of his students are working on a locomotive now. It will be a strange sight to see an iron horse puffing through the primeval jungles of the Stone Age, while cave bears, saber-toothed tigers, mastodons, and the countless other terrible creatures of the past look on from their tangled lairs in wide-eyed astonishment. We are very happy, Diane and I, and I would not return to the outer world for all the riches of all its princes, I am content here. Even without my imperial powers and honors, I should be content. For have I not that greatest of all treasures, the love of a good woman, my wondrous empress, Diane the Beautiful? End of chapter 15 End of Pellucidar by Edgar Rice Burroughs